Hello and welcome to Ocean Witness, the series that takes a deep dive into all things sea related. I'm Sophie Duker. And I'm Simon Watt. And today we'll be looking at an issue that affects us all. There's no escaping it, so join us and buckle up as we fight, fight climate, climate change. change. So it's a climate emergency. Yeah, it's that serious. seems like a good word for it, actually. It's a appropriate level of uh, alert, I think, for what's going on. But we shouldn't give up. Like This is just a sign that we, we have to take more action. We shouldn't get cynical. We shouldn't think there's no point trying because everybody needs to act now. Exactly. And coming up on today's show, we'll meet Paul, the Arctic Sunrises ice pilot. We'll head to the North Sea to learn some disturbing truths about oil exploration. We'll learn how fish carcasses might provide a climate change solution, and we'll be getting the polar bear necessities with Gordon Buchanan. But first, this September, Greenpeace ship the Arctic Sunrise headed north to the Arctic. And the reason for going at that time of year is because this is when the sea ice retreats to its minimum point, essentially opening up a brand new ocean. On board the ship was friend of the show, Maya Rose Craig, also known as Bird Girl. Do you remember from last series, she taught us all about all things penguin? Let's see how she got on. It is up here, isn't it? I'm Maya Rose Craig, and I'm an 18-year-old British environmental campaigner and activist. And I'm really excited because Greenpeace has invited me to go up to the Arctic with them this month. We're going to be looking at the new ocean that's being revealed as the ice caps are melting, but also trying to push through the Global Ocean Treaty at the UN to try and protect the wildlife and the new habitat that's being revealed. So the transit up north so far has been a bit rocky for me. I've had good days and bad days, um, but I probably have spent about half the journey so far feeling very, very sick very seasick, so it's been a little bit embarrassing, um, but I'm feeling fine now. It's completely different to anything I've ever experienced before. It's been proper ship life. It was just so exciting. And one of the biggest highlights of the trip is to help with scientific research. We're understanding parts of the landscape that have never been explored before, and I think that this is going to be such an essential contribution to the future. You can hear all the ice popping. Yeah. It sounds slightly like a river, actually. Yeah, it does. Like, it's like water dripping in a cave or something, isn't it? It's quite haunting because we can hear icebergs literally melting. And that is almost quite an, an emotional, sad sound, really, when we know that we're losing the mass of our glaciers at an unprecedented rapid rate. I have a few personal goals as well coming up to the Arctic. I'm a massive bird watcher and I had three species that I was desperate to see up here and that was Ivory Gull, Brunix Guillemot and Little Orc which are all amazing birds that you... Speaking of birds, what are those? They were black Guillemot. Sick, I've seen two off my list. <laughs> okay, right, sorted. That's two out of three. I've pictured a thousand times what the Arctic was going to look like, what it was going to feel like when I was finally there and it was nothing like that. It was so much more beautiful and so much more tranquil than I like ever pictured. I 
At the same time though, seeing the slush all around the boat, seeing these pieces of ice float away into the sea, I am watching the Arctic melt in this moment. This year is yet another year when the Arctic sea ice melts to a near record low. And the rapid loss of sea ice in the Arctic, it's a sobering indicator of how closely our planet is circling the drain. Environmental justice and social justice go hand in hand, as it's often the most marginalized people who, who bear the brunt of climate crisis, of ocean destruction. There's millions of climate change refugees at the moment. I have a lot of family that lives in Bangladesh and a lot of the time people in my village are struggling to grow enough crops to keep them going from year to year. There's cyclones battering down on the coast. Everything, every biome in the world is interconnected even if they're on the opposite sides of the world to one another. I mean, there's very direct connections between the Arctic and Bangladesh in terms of sea level rise, in terms of the country slowly going underwater. We're past the point of a wake-up call, we're past the point of ignorance. We need to make sure that our leaders, our decision makers, understand and care enough to do something about it. There's two ways it could go, and we need to think really hard about what our priorities are. By the time I'm 30, this could all be gone. And joining us now are two people who are on board the Arctic Sunrise, Maya Rose Craig and Laura Meller. Hello. 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 Can we start with you, Myros? Rose, because this was a big trip for you. You got the chance to see some birds that you've never seen before, ones you've been waiting to take off the list. Can you please tell us what was that like? What did you see? Yeah, of course. So I am a massive bird watcher and I was very excited about the potential birds that I could see up north. Um, and the one I was looking forward to the most um, was called an ivory gull, which you don't really get anywhere except the Arctic. And I was very nervous as if I was going to see them or not. Um, but it turned out there were like, flocks of hundreds of them all across the ice and I had these amazing views and that was one of the highlights of the trip for me. When you were there you were part of sort of a wake-up call involving lots of youth climate activists uh, giving a wake-up call to world leaders. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was and what it was like to be a part of? On one of the last days of the trip um, was this UN biodiversity conference where world leaders were coming together to talk about the future of the environment, essentially. So Greenpeace organised this wake up call um, so that we could tell these leaders directly what we thought about these issues. And I thought it was such an amazing event just because there were so many young people that were so passionate about the environment and telling them exactly what they thought. Lara, why is it so crucial that we protect the Arctic in particular? Well, the Arctic is a very, very unique place. There are there are a lot of a lot of different types of life that doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet. But of course, uh, the Arctic, uh, the Arctic Ocean, and the the sea ice in particular has a very important role in keeping the planet cool, as as the ice is reflecting the the heat that comes from the sun back to the space. You were telling us there about the sea ice minimum and how this is kind of like taking the pulse of the Arctic. Well, what do we need to do to stop that getting worse? The good news in it is that we know exactly what we need to do. So we need to immediately cut the climate wrecking emissions down to zero. And we need to create a network of ocean sanctuaries around the planet to help marine life and give it, give it the chance to cope with the changes and to recover and to heal. Can you give us an update on the UN negotiations for a global ocean treaty? It looks like there is a lot of um, will. So the key elements that we want to see on the treaty, which is that it should make it possible to create ocean sanctuaries in the global oceans uh, and fully protect them as well. Um, all the options are there. So it's very possible that we will get a strong global ocean treaty agreed next year. And to make that possible, we 
all need to make sure that we do everything we can to hold our governments accountable so that the ministers understand uh, that they really must bring home a strong treaty next year. Thank you, my Rose and Laura. That was inspiring. Goodbye. Sophie, do you remember Dr. Kirsten Thompson from last series? She was the one who taught us all about eDNA. I do. She also told us how to identify whales using just their tails, which I was very good at. It was just a fluke. <sighs> well, Dr. Kirsten Thompson was also back on the Arctic sunrise, this time carrying out eDNA work in areas that it has never been done before. We're in the Arctic, on the Arctic sunrise. The Arctic is an incredibly beautiful place. It's really, really special. We are investigating the impacts of humans on the Arctic ecosystem. And we're actually sat inside the science container, which is a specially modified a shipping container, which we've turned into a lab, which is a fantastic place to work and store our samples and all our equipment. We know that the Arctic ecosystem is changing really rapidly. The ice is receding really quickly, the whole ecosystem is changing, and the distribution of species is changing quite quickly as well. So it's important to really get into monitoring these areas now so that we can understand the impact of climate change on these species later. In previous years, this would have been entirely covered in ice. eDNA would be novel in this area. No one's done it before, so we'd be the first. We're here to do eDNA sampling, looking for a genetic fingerprint of the species that live in these waters. We want to do that very close to the ice. And the difficulty is finding um, open water that allows us to use our ribs, our small boats, but also having that close to the ice where we're not going to get bits of ice all done in the sampling gear. It's an important time to start cataloguing um, the species that are here. So eDNA stands for environmental DNA. So that's DNA that's floating around in the environment. So if an animal passes through an area, it's going to be sloughing cells from its body. So that could be skin cells, it could be mucus, say from fish skin, or it could be poo. As it travels through the area, it leaves behind these cells in the water. We're basically trapping the DNA on this filter, and then we pour in some buffer to preserve that DNA, and then we keep it really nice and clean and send it back to the lab for sequencing. And just by looking at those very small pieces of DNA, we can work out what animals, things like whales, seals, birds, and fish species, might have traveled through this area. So we've just deployed the hydrophone out after the ship, and that's basically a 350 meter cable and on the end of it is an oil-filled hydrophone with four hydrophone elements. And basically what we're doing is we're just making continuous recording of all whale and dolphin noises and then also all the noises that might be emitted by nearby ships or anything like that. We're feeding this data into huge databases which will be available for scientists forever because you need to know what lives in an area so that you know where to protect. It's really important that these areas are protected now because as the sea ice recedes, they're becoming more and more vulnerable, not only to environmental change, but also to the impact of human activities. So we need to make sure that we have really well-protected networks of marine protected areas here because these are unique habitats with some very unique species that live nowhere else in the world. So this really, needs to happen now. And Kirsten joins us now. Hello, welcome back. Hi guys, how are you? Great, looking forward to hearing more about your more recent research because this is, well, it's pioneering. Yeah, well, yeah, we are um, one of the first people to, to survey 
at further than 82 degrees north. It's really, really far north. What was it like working in this area that, that shouldn't really be there? Yeah, and it is a really sad realization when you're there and you suddenly realize that you're in an area of the ocean that is, is only accessible because the ice is retreating so fast. So essentially that was quite a sobering thought for all of us on the ship. So last series, Kirsten, we know you collected data from all around the world on the pole to pole expedition. And we hear you've got some exciting results from that to share with us. Yeah, so we have some of the results from the Sargasso Sea in Mount Vima. Um, and Mount Vima, of course, is the sea mount off of South Africa. And it's such an exciting process, science, I tell you. When you get the results back, it's really thrilling. So we have um, results from the eDNA monitoring and also the hydrophone work that we did there. And the eDNA showed that we had detections of pelagic fish, so things like blue sharks and uh, bluefin tuna, um, and kingfish, but also some of the deep sea species as well. So that was really interesting. And we also, for me, I was most excited because we actually had a detection of a really elusive, rarely seen type of whale called a dwarf sperm whale. And these things are really weird creatures. They are only about three and a half meters long. So they're really difficult to see in the open ocean. And they have this weird startling, uh, startle response. So if you were to disrupt them and startle them, they actually eject this odd brown liquid, a bit like a squid does. So I find them quite fascinating. Um, and we also were able to detect things like say whale and humpback whales. Um, the team on board actually observed humpbacks feeding. So that really does confirm this area as a feeding ground um, for humpback whales. Um, and we also heard humpback whales, say whales, and detected a, um, a actually recorded a sort of uh, baleen whale call that is actually unknown to science. So this really important work that we're able to publish now and um, put out to the wider scientific community. Can you tell us why are the sea mines so important? These areas are hotspots for biodiversity. So. We find quite rich fish communities on, on certain sea mounts, and they're also quite important for migrating whales. So whales appear to use them as feeding areas um, whilst they're on their big long migration journeys, but also they might actually use them as navigational aids. So there's a lot that we don't know about sea mounts, but we do know that they're really important and they should be protected in the open oceans. Well, thanks so much, because people like you working on this gives me hope too. Thank you, Kristen. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Now it's time to talk about fossil fuels. We all know they are driving the climate emergency and many of us are trying to reduce the rate at which we burn them. But we know less about what happens at the moment they are extracted from the sea floor. This summer, a Greenpeace team headed out onto the North Sea to shine a light on an unseen problem. Yeah, we are on board of the Esperanza in the North Sea. We've been sailing in between British and Norwegian waters for the last two weeks and two more weeks to come. And we are here to collect evidence and shadow the oil and gas industry on their exploration of these waters. We were just passing by an oil rig and came closer to take some pictures and then realized that this oil rig was leaking and we had an oil spill on the surface of the sea. So we launched a boat and documented it from closer and took some samples. So this is a very clear indication that this platform, Andrew 1628, has a significant problem because uh, it looks like the separators are not working properly. We have uh, big chunks of brownish material um, swimming on the water surface. And this is definitely something that we will report to authorities. On another day, we went to a site where there is a well-documented um, methane leak, where once an um, exploration went wrong, there was a big explosion on the ground. So on board, we have an ROV, which is a little submarine. It's um, driven by some specialists we have invited to come to work along with us. And we sent down the ROV again. We found a place. And yeah, it was devastating to realize that it's been going on for 30 years now and nobody really cares. Climate-destroying methane 
a greenhouse gas 28 times more powerful than carbon dioxide has been leaking from these craters without any action by responsible companies or politicians. There are more than 15,000 boreholes all across the North Sea. Many of them are leaking gas amounting to an estimated 30,000 tons of methane being released into the atmosphere every year on top of the already 72,000 tons of methane being released by oil and gas platforms during normal operation mode. This is a scandal. We've been just visited by some dolphins that shows clearly that this is not an industrial zone or our dumping ground, but home to a lot of diverse marine wildlife. We're experiencing different times thanks to COVID-19 now and have a great opportunity to overthink the way that we want to live in the future and where our tax money is going. And I don't think it should go to this industry that is causing so much harm and pollution to our environment and destroying the only planet that we have. And we're joined now by Christian Bissau from Greenpeace Germany. Hello, Christian. Hi. Hi, hello. We just saw the methane leak that you went to document. How did it feel to see it? Yeah, it was absolutely shocking when we saw the methane coming out of the seafloor. It was really like a whirlpool. It was unbelievable, unbelievable because this is happening at that spot for 30 years now. It started in 1990 because at that time the oil industry had a blowout there. And since that time, methane is entering the environment and destroying our climate. Well, as you say there, this is a huge issue that continues and it's going to show that the oil industry has not done anything about it yet. So what action can be taken? In every step, the oil industry is polluting the environment and destroying our climate. When they start to explore for oil, when they produce the oil, and when they at the very end sell the oil at the gas stations and then the oil is burned, every step is damaging our world. At the moment, nothing is happening. The oil industry can do what they want out there. No one is really controlling them. We have really to change the system. We have to go away from the fossil fuels. And therefore, our demand should be no more new oil exploration and the production has to stop as soon as possible. Otherwise, we cannot have a healthy future for our children. This week in Life on Board, we're meeting Paul, the ice pilot on board the Arctic Sunrise. And what does an ice pilot do? You're about to find out. Rule number one for ice, avoid it. Rule number two is go slow. Yeah. The ship is classed as an icebreaker, but you don't want to be going at speed and hitting a piece of ice that's really hard or old ice. In 1988, I got on my first Greenpeace ship in Canada as a volunteer. This will be my 32nd voyage, I believe. I'm on the Arctic sunrise in the position of ice navigator. That means I advise the captain uh, about ice conditions and how to proceed safely. The Arctic sunrise has what's called a crow's nest. It's approximately 27 meters above the sea level. It's a small workspace that the uh, captain can pass controls of the ship from the bridge up to the crow's nest to me. And at that time, I can have full ship control. I have control of the main engine, the pitch on the propeller, and the rudder for steering. I'm going to pass the steering now, eh? with two bumps. Okay, ready. I have zero on the rudder now. So I can go ahead, astern, port, starboard, and increase or decrease the speed as I need to. Gives you a great view from up there. From 27 meters high, I can see a lot further in front of me. Then I can look and pick my way through the ice, through the leads, avoid the heavy stuff, and pass through the, the thinner ice. 
the uh, first year, second year ice, we can push our way through a lot easier. Old ice, or harder ice, multi-year ice you want to avoid. We can still maneuver amongst the old ice inclusions, but uh, that means a little more sensitivity and finesse. Does it get lonely in the crow's nest? No, that's the one place I can go and stand on the hatch and no one can get to me. They can send me up a coffee if they want, but uh, I bring my music up there with me too, so. <laughs> Over my last several years, uh, my voyages to the Arctic, I've seen a lot less ice concentration. And this year, I've looked at the ice charts uh, between Canada and Greenland, and there's absolutely no ice at the moment. Well, there's a number of countries that are almost drooling at the fact that the Arctic is melting, opening up, making it more accessible to look for more fossil fuels that we can't even afford to burn. In 2013, uh, we were up in the Arctic trying to tell the world that Russia is continuing to look for more oil. We went there to non-violently protest, and the Russian authorities, uh, I'll say, they didn't take it too kindly. So they boarded our ship, seized the ship, and they ordered us to go ashore at gunpoint um, and put 30 of us in jail. Now, the charges in the beginning uh, that they tried to nail us with were uh, piracy, and that was uh, 15 years in jail. I was in jail for one month before I had a phone call, so I was allowed to call home, and they told me it's amazing what's happening. There was two million people signing a petition. There was 11 Nobel laureates demanding for our release. After about two months in jail, when I came out and saw all the support, I couldn't believe it. Thank you. And then I'd almost thrown in the towel, so to say, given up the fight. I said, okay, it's been 30 years, I give up. You know, I, what more can I do? And then I saw this young Swedish girl, Greta, and how she was raising all this, uh, I'll say, attention, to say the least, about uh, climate change. We are tired of greenwashing empty words and promises from people who pretend to care about our future. And now we have uh, this young person on board, Maya Rose, and I see that there is still a movement, almost like an awakening of young people afoot that's trying to raise awareness about environmental issues, trying to stop all the atrocities, trying to promote renewable energies. Well, maybe there is a hope or a chance still, so. Here I am. I like how the ice pilot has an ironclad excuse to be antisocial. Yeah. And now we're sticking with the Arctic for our creature of the week. And this week's creature of the week is the polar bear. To really get to know this creature of the week, we decided to spend some time with someone who spent weeks at a time filming with polar bears and has probably got the closest anyone has to a polar bear while living to tell the tale. It's the wonderful wildlife filmmaker, Gordon Buchanan. Hi, Gordon. Hello, hello. So can you tell us, what is it like getting up close and personal with a polar bear? I mean, they, they are a truly remarkable animal and how they've adapted to live in a place where human beings struggle. And that's what I love, I suppose, love about spending time in the Arctic, love about polar bears is they, when times are good, they can, they can live with, with ease and they can prosper and do well and thrive. Uh, whereas for us, it can be a struggle to get from one hour to the, one hour to the next. So why are polar bears so particularly adapted to live in the Arctic and with sea ice? Well, polar bears are one of the most um, recently evolved creatures on the, on the planet. So they evolved from the grizzly bear. So it's a sort of slow adaptation that became evolution. And it was just, um, 
nature's way of seeing a, 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 a vacuum or seeing a void or seeing an opportunity. And those animals um, adapted um, their hunting strategy, their physiology changed to become, you know, the, the ultimate um, predator of the, the Arctic. I was lucky enough that I was, I was working with a scientist and we, he, he was putting a radio collar on a polar bear and doing a health check on it. So I was sort of hands on with this huge, huge bear and just to look at them in detail and you realize how well adapted they are. And um, you know, obviously they have to stay warm. They have to be able to kind of put on a huge amount of weight. They have to spend up to eight months without feeding when they're giving, when they're giving birth. And um, so, yeah, they're just one of those um, miracles or gifts of, of evolution that this animal exists. So really, uh, yeah, extraordinary. Thanks very much, Gordon. Brilliant, thank you so much. Thank you. So we've been hearing all about how damaging the climate emergency can be for our oceans and the people and animals who depend on them. But what if I was to tell you that our oceans can provide a solution by reducing the amount of CO2 released into the atmosphere? I'd say tell me more. A brand new scientific study has provided a simple solution. Leave more big fish in the sea. Joining us now is the report's lead author, Gael Mariani. Hello. Hi, Gael. Hi, everyone. So, Gael, please talk us through what you discovered. Yes, we discovered uh, how fish can help us to slow down climate change. The idea is that a fish is made up uh, of 10 to 15% carbon. And when a fish die, uh, dies naturally, its carcass sinks to the deep sea floor, and the carbon contained in the carcass is sequestered over several th thousand years. So when carbon is sequestered over a long period of time, it could help us to slow down climate change. So what kind of fish are we talking about here? What counts as a big fish? Uh, species of tuna, sharks, uh, billfish or mackerels. So there's already a natural system in place of carbon sink, but what is industrial fishing doing to disrupt that? Uh, yes, industrial fishing uh, impacts this uh, natural cycle in two ways. Uh, first, industrial fishing disrupts this natural carbon uh, sink provided by fish. And secondly, industrial fishing emits a lot of carbon dioxide because they uh, consume a large amount of fuel. Exactly how bad is the fishing industry in terms of carbon emissions? Uh, combined with emission due to fuel consumption, because uh, fishing boats uh, consume fuel, uh, we estimated that uh, more than uh, 20 million metric tons of carbon dioxide were emitted into the atmosphere in uh, 2014 due to uh, large fish fisheries. So tell me more there. That, that seems like a, it's a complicated issue. What should be our next move? We should not stop fishing for large fish because this is really important for food security. I think we have only studied the tip of the iceberg. Now the next move and the main objective of the PhD uh, is to uh, estimate how sustainable fisheries practices uh, would increase the capacity of fish to slow down climate change. Thanks for bringing us the good news, Kyle, and uh, good luck with the next phase of your studies. Thanks. And Bye. thanks and thanks for inviting me. Bye. That brings us to the end of the show and the end of this series. Any favourite moments, Sophie? Well, I loved meeting the Queen of Mantas. Uh, Andrea, yeah. Yeah. That was pretty fantastic. That was good. Part. For me, I think it must have been Dr. Kirsten Thompson. Um, we had her last series and she's still great. I think I want to be Kirsten when I grow up. She's amazing. Thank you for joining us in this voyage across the oceans and please keep up the fight. We need to put pressure on governments around the world to agree to a strong global ocean treaty at the UN. Check out the links below or above this video to find out how you can get involved. And we're going to leave you with some images from the Arctic. As we've seen today from Maya Rose in the UK and Gael in France, there are things we can do to protect the oceans and fight climate change. Now join us and the crew of the Arctic Sunrise for a moment of quiet contemplation. <laughs>